Today, we have the Botanix Pharmaceuticals Investor Webinar. On the call today, we're joined by Executive Director Matt Callahan, Chief Operating Officer Howie McKibben, and we're also joined by Triangle Insights Group Partner Gautam Agarwal. At the end of the webinar, we'll be having a Q&A session. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the written Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen, and we will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. The webinar will last about 45 minutes. And if we aren't able to answer your question during the webinar, please submit it to the information email and we will endeavor to answer everyone. Thank you very much. I'll now hand over to Howie to begin. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's an exciting time at Botanics right now. And we wanted to take this opportunity to, uh, number one, thank you for your support. Thank you for your attendance tonight. And you know, share some uh, exciting news that we've gotten as we quickly approach our, our mid-cycle review that we're anticipating to uh, occur by the end of this quarter, which is by the end of this month. Uh, and as we've discussed before, things certainly speed up post that mid-cycle review. Coming out of that meeting, we're going to know uh, whether there are any issues that are going to impede our progress with regard to uh, approval. And once we have that information in hand, we are fully focused on launching the product, uh, getting to a revenue generating company and, and ultimately profitability. We'd also like to share some uh, new commercial information that we have as we completed our market research and further analyze these data uh, that really bode well, we believe, for the outcome of the product. So why don't we head to the next slide and after that, we'll bring back uh, Gotham Eggle. So just, just a little bit on uh, botanics for those who, who may be new. We're a dermatology-focused company uh, on, on treatments for skin diseases, uh, such as excessive sweating or hyperhidrosis, rosacea and acne, as well as uh, life-threatening bacterial infections. We have a pretty solid team behind us. That team that includes uh, Vincent Bolito, uh, Dr. Patty Walker, who came to us from Brickell prior to that, Allergan and Inamed, uh, as well as Matt Callahan, have launched, developed, and launched into the marketplace over 30 products in dermatology. We'll be focused today on sophronium bromide, which is our now our lead compound post the acquisition last year. And for those who don't know, it's the first and only new drug or new chemical entity for primary axillary hyperhidrosis. That's a medical condition that results in excessive, excessive underarm sweating when you're not supposed to be sweating. And keep in mind, this product is already approved in Japan at a lower concentration. And first year, I'm sorry, second year sales were uh, pro projected to be or approach 300,000 units. We see an opportunity for consolidation right now in dermatology. There's a lot of companies out there that uh, may, may have one or two small products, but have the overhead uh, that's duplicative for what may be occurring at other companies. So we see an opportunity com to potentially combine these products and add to our portfolio in the future. But right now we're focused on, on SB. And we spoke about the mid-cycle review meeting catalyst. Again, coming out of that meeting, we're gonna know uh, if there are any issues at all getting in the way of, of our approval. And once we have that assurance, we significantly de-risk this asset. So I'd like to turn it over to Gotham. Gotham will introduce himself, but I'd like to just give a quick background here. I've worked with Triangle Associates, and many of their partners in the past, at Dermavant, uh, at Anacor. Now, Anacor is that company that we did sell to Pfizer for $5.2 billion, as well as Metasys that ultimately sold to Bausch Health for $2.6 billion. And they have foothold and expertise in dermatology. And he'll share some of the other companies that he's worked with. Gotham, thank you for your time. Thank you, Howie. And thank you, everyone, for the time today. Uh, as Howie mentioned, kind of today's focus is really to share some insights from the work that Triangle Insights has done over the last several months and to talk a little bit about the opportunity that Botanics has within the hyperhidrosis market. I'll kind of start off with 
a little bit of background about who I am and who Triangle Insights is. So my background uh, is Gautam Agarwal, one of the founding partners of a boutique life sciences consulting firm with a focus kind of across therapeutic areas, but, but as Howie mentioned, across several of the companies that he's worked at historically, but also across dermatology. If we can go to the next slide, Triangle Insights and I personally have worked across a lot of the key leading pharmaceutical companies that have a dermatology focus. We've actually conducted north of 100 engagements with the kind of companies like Anacor, Dermavent, and of course Botanics, but have done a, a lot of work in conditions like hyperhidrosis and the other dermatologic markets. Uh, we do have a, a very high share of our focus in dermatology. I have been personally doing kind of consulting within the pharmaceutical space for about 20 years. And as you can see with the logos here, we have helped several of these companies help launch or think about market strategy or the commercial opportunity for the brands that they have developed in these markets with a focus on the U.S. market. Um, so, so today's discussion is going to focus on some of the insights that we've generated as we've looked at the secondary kind of research and opportunity in hyperhidrosis and conducted about 50-55 market research conversations with across a, a range of stakeholders for botanics over the last several months. Uh, the engagement that we conducted was fairly robust and fairly detailed. We worked with the botanics leadership team to really think about the opportunity here in detail and think about what strategy makes the most sense. So I'll probably spend about 10, 15 minutes walking through that opportunity in a synthesized way across the next several slides. Let's go to the next slide. So just in terms of introduction, for the hyperhidrosis market. I think it is important to understand that this is a, a, a medical condition like how we mentioned. It's also important to understand that this is a chronic medical condition. This is something that happens throughout the year. And as we take a look at the commercial opportunity, we think a little bit about how many prescriptions a patient could get as you look at the funnel of the patients on the right-hand side. But the fact that this is a medically recognized condition, I think is important because then that results in the ability to have this be reimbursed and covered by medical payers within the U.S. healthcare system. I think another data point that's important for the for investors and for the community to understand is the fact that this disease is truly much kind of very much of a consumer mindset. You know, the aspects of this disease is that it actually does cause perspectives of personal well-being, but does also have kind of physiological impact from a patient well-being perspective. As you take a look at the, the schematic and the visual and the patient funnel on the right-hand side, which ultimately shows about 4 million treated patients and about 10 million patients of axillary hyperhidrosis, one of the key takeaways that we really had as we had discussions with the botanics team was that this is an undertreated market. Uh, there are several patients who are not being treated or, or are not actually being treated as aggressively as they could be just because of the limited therapeutic options that exist today. We'll talk about this a little bit more in subsequent slides, but you know, one of the key drugs that works within the space is Botox. And when you take a look at a drug like Botox, which is an injectable that you have to inject kind of under your arms, uh, several injections, uh, there's 40, 50% of patients who typically say that they don't want to do that just because of the invasiveness or the perceived and the pain involved with underarm injection. So you know, the, the under-treatment in this market, we do think creates opportunities for companies competing in this space in the future. Let's go to the next slide. As we take a look at uh, the, the research we did, I did want to highlight kind of the additional work that we've done since our, our last conversation, which is really much more focused on getting feedback on the target product profile for Botanics' as product. So a couple of things to note, uh, take note here. One is just because of the, the way the US healthcare system works and because of transparency and reporting requirements, you'll see that there isn't any reference to botanics or to SB specifically, just because you wanted to maintain a double blind nature. But other than that, everything here is completely from what's anticipated to be within the label, the data that has come from the clinical studies that have already been conducted by botanics. Uh, you will see a little bit more of this in subsequent discussed slides, but one of the key compelling data points within the slide that was compelling, especially to physicians, is that first graph on the left in the middle of the slide, which shows roughly 60% improvement versus 40% improvement for placebo. And what, what, you, what you'll see is that that difference eventually was very meaningful from a patient and a physician perspective. 
Uh, the other thing I'll mention, and what's important from a differentiation perspective for SV, is the, the way the product is, is, is delivered. Uh, what we heard was, especially when you compare the product to products like Hebrexa, the fact that it is more tolerable, easier to apply, was something that was actually very compelling to physicians and to patients. Let's go to the next slide. So what this slide portrays is the current treatment paradigm for hyperhidrosis. So starting on the left-hand side, you'll see that quite a few patients, not everyone, but 80% of patients based on our market research and I understand that this is a condition that is ideally treated by a dermatologist. Prior to that, they may can recognize they have hyperhidrosis and they try over-the-counter options. But once those fail, and those do fail quite often, uh, the patient will show up at the dermatologist's office. This may take a while. This may take several months. But once they show up to the dermatologist, the dermatologist will typically prescribe prescription topical antiperspirants like Drysol. In the U.S. market, there's roughly half a million prescriptions of Drysol, which is the the brand, the, the prescription uh, antiperspirant, which are prescribed in any given year. I do want to compare that number to even a number that Howie mentioned a few a few minutes ago in terms of 300,000 prescriptions in the Japanese market. And of course, the Japanese patient population, the world market size, is roughly a third of the U.S. market. So, so we, we do think the fact that there's already at least a half a million scripts of Rysol is compelling in terms of what the opportunity for a product like what SB could represent, but that's in first line. As you see, almost half the patients won't uh, react as effectively as possible on that first line option and then move to products like Kibrexa or Botox or systemic orals. Uh, as we take a look at products like Botox, we see roughly 100,000 plus patients who are on Botox for hyperhidrosis. So once again, a sizable market that we think could eventually be targeted by Botanix. Um, and then eventually kind of even more invasive third line uh, therapeutic options. Uh, a couple of things I'm to, to continue to highlight here is that, and you'll see more of this in the subsequent slide, is we do think products like, um, like Botanix have a high share or high relevance in second line, but we do see the possibility, especially if a product is priced right, physicians spoke to us quite a bit about the possibility of using a product like this, even in first line. So we'll talk a little bit about that first line and second line dynamic more in subsequent slides. Let's go to the next slide. So as we take a look at this slide, on the left-hand side, you'll see what the current prescription preferences are, on the top of the visual for first line, on the bottom for second line. On the, on the right-hand side, you'll see what our market research with physicians, 20 dermatologists suggested in terms of future prescribing patterns, uh, with blue being, of course, the use of SB. On the left-hand side, what you'll see is, this is what physicians ideally say that they want to do. Now, in terms of what they want to do and what they end up doing, there often are adjustments that are made. And even as we think about the future utilization of SB, we've thought about some of those adjustments and strategy discussions that we've had with the Botanics team. But I want to highlight that uh, you'll see the majority of patients in terms of first-line treatment are getting those topical prescription antiperspirants, roughly 60% of patients. 20% of patients, physicians actually want to use Cubrexa. Now, in reality, that number is actually quite a bit lower because Cubrexa doesn't have good coverage in, in first line. So one of the key insights here was making sure that the pricing and the strategy and the positioning of Botanix's product allows for utilization in first line is going to be important because half the patients do succeed with first line use. Uh, and when we take a look at second line, we'll see that the, the, the treatment paradigm does shift from those topicals to much more of those orals and products like Botox. Importantly, when we introduce the target product profile that we showed a few slides ago, what we see is that uh, SB is actually the, the largest bar of all of these. So you'll see 40% utilization plus in first line, 50% utilization in second line. So physicians really are talking about the fact, and when we spoke to them, that the efficacy, the safety, the way the product is applied, all really made sense to them and was a superior product as compared to some of the other products in market. Of course, kind of given pricing, given the generic nature of some of these other drugs, uh, SB wouldn't necessarily get all the prescriptions, but we do think that there's a high likelihood, position right, price right, 
that the product would gain significant traction in this large market. Let's go to the next slide. As we take a look at what was the most compelling in the discussions that we've had, especially with the physicians, what we'll see is what I highlighted in the visual and the target product profile a few slides ago, where that 60% improvement of at least two points on the qualitative scoring system versus 40% was the most compelling data point and really made them feel that the product really did work and would result in really good patient um, satisfaction, especially when coupled with that second data point of 85% of patients having, having at least a one point improvement in their mind, in physicians' minds, they felt that essentially every patient in a nine out of 10, eight out of 10 of patients would really be happy with the use of this product and would then continue to use a product like this compared to especially some of the products in terms of the inferiority that they have. When you think about things like the tolerability or the application of these the products, um, the, the applicator for, for, for SB was definitely something which uh, patients and physicians said would be something that would be easy to use and it really fit into the daily habits of these patients compared to what the current treatment options and alternatives were. Let's get to the next slide. The next slide highlights some key takeaways in terms of the conversations that we had across some of these different stakeholders. So as I mentioned, we spoke to about 20 different physicians. We spoke to about 10 different payers and 20 different patients. As we think about the 20 different dermatologists we spoke to, on a seven-point Likert satisfaction scale, uh, physicians rated this a 5.9, roughly a six-point on the seven-point scale. That kind of, uh, we, we do hundreds of these assessments a year, a six on a seven-point scale uh, roughly translates to a top 25% type performance in terms of an asset, which I think is correlated to high likelihood of commercial success, especially as you couple this with the, reg kind of the regulatory status of where SB is, especially as it's approving, kind of get, approaching that midterm uh, review cycle. Um, some of the key aspects that drove this, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, was that efficacy of 60 and 85%, but also the applicator were all things that were really compelling to physicians. As we saw in the previous slide, uh, a lot of physicians did say that they would want to try to use this in first line. They did realize that there would be a likelihood that some payers, and we'll talk more about this in the next panel as we get to this in the next column, is that payers may restrict the use of this in first line, but if the product was priced right, if they had good coverage, if they had good support models for patients, then they may even try to use this in the first line because they felt the product was superior to the other treatment options. But ultimately we were thinking that this product would at least get application and utilization in that second line patient segment. As we think about the 10 pairs we spoke to, and just a little bit of a landscape kind of mindset from a US pair perspective, the US pair uh, market is more fragmented than a lot of other markets and is much more of a multi-payer system. But once you start to speak to some of the major pharmaceutical benefit managers, and there's roughly three to four key PBMs in the US market, and we spoke to all of them. Uh, so with an N equals 10 of market research, we were really able to kind of get a pulse on what we think the coverage for a product like this could look like at different price points. Ultimately, payers, and even as you look at that 4.2 and a seven point scale, payers are much more conservative in terms of the receptivity and the feedback that they give to products. But the four on the seven point scale is again kind of not uh, is in the top 50% of, of what we would typically expect um, for a product like this. And ultimately, what payers told us was that they did feel that there was an unmet need within this market, especially you know, given some of the you know, lack of therapeutic options. And they didn't necessarily see this as a large commercial spend market. A lot of kind of the lens that payers think through when they're thinking about coverage of new products is how much is it going to cost them in aggregate? Given the relatively low price points for a product like this compared to oncology or other specialty drugs, they didn't necessarily feel too concerned about covering products that were FDA approved within hyperhidrosis. Uh, we did speak to also some, some patients, about 20 hyperhidrosis patients, and the feedback from these patients was also very powerful in terms of they spoke to us a little bit about the emotional impact that hyperhidrosis has on their daily well-being. And they also spoke about the, some of the challenges with using products like Botox or some of the application issues with products like Cubrexa. And they felt that uh, 
uh, Botanics's product really provided that combination of good efficacy, safety, tolerability, and a good ease of administration. So as we take a look at the three stakeholders that matter from a U.S. healthcare perspective, we really did end up with a mindset of we felt that the target product profile was sufficient in terms of what each of these stakeholders was looking for to be able to ultimately be a commercially successful product. Let's get to the next slide. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about in the next few slides is starting to think about what does some of our market research findings mean in terms of the commercial strategy and the positioning of how SB would be positioned, how botanics would potentially go after targeting the patients and the physicians that matter within hyperhidrosis. One of the aspects that was comforting to us because we were kind of thinking about who ultimately would be the physicians that would be the most relevant to call upon to make sure that you can cover uh, prescribing for the hyperhidrosis patients was uh, the fact that almost 80% of the patients knew that they wanted to show up to the dermatologist office rather than the primary care, making it a much more targeted call point. When you think about the number of dermatologists in the US, you're looking at roughly 5,000 kind of physicians who matter from a dermatology perspective and ends up being much more of a tractable patient, tractable physician population that you can target with a relatively small or moderate number of sales reps. We'll talk about other even higher ROI approaches towards that in a second, but the fact that we saw that consolidation in terms of an understanding of dermatology was important. Uh, we, we also kind of heard from, from the conversations that we had that despite this, kind of there is still, as we showed on that first patient funnel slide, there is a high level of under-treatment within this market, just given the lack of therapeutic options and the fact that some of the drugs that really work well are drugs like Botox that are more invasive and require injections and are harder from a patient uh, well-being perspective. Next slide. So as we start to turn to some of the commercial ways of succeeding within this market, we do think given the consumer nature of this disease, given how it impacts patients, not only you know, actual physical manifestations, but also their, their well-being in terms of how they interact with their, their friends, their colleagues, it's important to think a little bit about the commercial ways of targeting these patients that go beyond just speaking to dermatologists and thinking about things like having a high level of targeting social media, get more um, get a viral internet, YouTube, and having the right type of spokespeople who can, who can speak to this disease, we think is going to be important to be able to commercially succeed within this market. We actually did have a conversation with some of the key leaders at, at uh, kind of Dermera and other, uh, their other dermatologic focused companies that have focused on hyperhidrosis and learned quite a bit about recommendations that we've had conversations with the botanics team with in terms of how to succeed in launching and, and having this product be prescribed as appropriately as possible to a larger swath of patients with hyperhidrosis. Go to the next slide. As an example, we do want to talk a little bit about what we've seen in the last couple of years. I mean, there is a degree of a post-COVID approach where we started to see uh, a much more targeted and higher ROI approach where, especially for disease states like hyperhidrosis and what we're showing with this case study with FEXI, which is a non-hormonal non contraceptive for conditions that are more consumer focused, more patient well-being focused, we are starting to see a much more of an approach where pharmaceutical companies can supplement it in-person sales folders with much more of a trying to get patients to a website. And on that website, there could be a physician who is responsible for diagnosing appropriately and treating that patient with the therapeutic that, that the company is targeting. Uh, and, and what you'll see in terms of some of the key data points for that is typically when a patient shows up to the physician's office, there typically is that five to 10% of those patients would end up on the prescription drug that you are ideally wanting to have them be on as a manufacturer. Versus when they go to a website like what we've seen with a company like 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 Evofem and Fexi, north of 50%, 60% of patients would end up on the product. So that 10x ratio of success and even the lower cost of doing this on a website, we think are approaches that companies like Botanic should can definitely think more about in the future, especially in these consumer-focused 
markets like hyperhidrosis. So we think we think there is an opportunity to leverage that in addition to the traditional region frequency approaches of a uh, sales force of uh, targeting dermatologists. So overall, I wanted to kind of to, to end with just a few observations in terms of as we've tested the TPP in a fairly robust evaluation across multiple stakeholders, we did hear good positive feedback in terms of the relevance of this product within the treatment algorithm across first line and second line utilization. Happy to take questions as we approach the end. I know how we wanted to, to translate some of these strategic observations into the strategy and into the thinking going forward from a botanics and a brand perspective. So Howie, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, why don't we head to the next slide here and then we'll close up and, and take some questions. Just a little bit of summary here. Let, let me point out with 16 uh, million patients in the US, this would be the, the third, or this is the third largest medical derm condition. Uh, over twice the size of psoriasis, which has been, been a huge target for uh, development in the past. So we believe clearly there's some untapped potential here. Uh, 10 million of those individuals have axillary hyperhidrosis. 3.7 million are still in the office or, or seeing the physician. So, so here's what that means for us. Right? Those 3.7 million that are already in the office will be targeted with a small uh, efficient sales force of about 30 to 35 sales reps. And we can get to those 4,500 to 5,000 dermatologists with the appropriate activity to ensure what we believe will be a quick uptake in establishing that beachhead, both of patients and, and physician advocates. Uh, the longer term growth opportunity is the, the remainder of those 10 million patients who are not in the physician office. And they are not going there for a plethora of reasons. Uh, certainly they've been disappointed in the, in the past. Uh, they're, they're a bit of a recluse population who has to uh, plan their whole day uh, around this condition. And, you know, they've developed their own coping skills. Uh, you know, whether it's wearing three or four shirts or putting pads underneath their arms, uh, they, they, they figured out how to at least deal with this enough to take part in the minimal daily activities. But they are on the internet searching for uh, new solutions and they're, they're, they're pretty easy to find. So there's a very good potential to put information in front of those patients who are already looking for a solution, get them right to a telemedicine physician where they can answer a uh, four or five question questionnaire and be diagnosed by that physician and sent directly to, to our partner pharmacies who will mail that prescription to their home along with the appropriate refills. So this two-pronged approach of establishing that beachhead of patients but, but also those physician advocates, and then growing longer term efficiently uh, provides that upside, not just at the beginning, but we believe throughout the product life cycle. Next slide, just to close here. So we've been talking about what we had planned on doing for a while uh, since, since last year. And you know, as you know, those phase three clinical trials had been completed. We prepared feverishly for that NDA submission which was accepted and we received our day 74 letter uh, signaling that the package was complete. And we are approaching the mid-cycle review by the end of this month. And we will receive written feedback from the agency signaling whether or not there are any significant review issues. In my experience, once you have the green light of the clear pathway, many things can happen between then and approval. Certainly things speed up quite a bit. We are going to be preparing for commercial launch and revenue generation uh, by you know, the end of, of Q4, early Q1, and building the appropriate efficient organization. Uh, during that time period, in my experience, we've also seen a uptick with regard to activity from uh, potential partners and suitors, whether it's in the United States or, or ex-US. So it'll be a very, very busy time, a time that uh, we believe de-risks us with regard to approval, which gives us the confidence to start putting the appropriate resources uh, behind that launch. And ultimately, in, in Q3 of 2023, we are expecting our uh, PDUFA date and, and ultimately our FDA approval. So again, 
this was the plan so far. We are you know, executing on that plan. And we believe this is a very significant, not just milestone for the company, but an inflection point uh, with regard to uh, our, our potential market cap and growth. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're going to let or ask Matt to moderate questions now for us and happy to answer anything that comes our way. Thanks, Howie, and, and hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along today. Um, we've got a, a bunch of questions. I'm going to summarize, I think, a couple of the, uh, the ones we can get out of the way very quickly. Um, uh, Ryan asked a question around the time period for the FDA to process and approve SB. Uh, I think this slide that's up here at the moment kind of answers that question. Uh, Mid-cycle review coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks and then uh, approval in, in Q3 of this year. Um, there's a question here, maybe Howie, for you from Will. Um, have we got the production factory organised and is that in, in the US or Japan? Do you want to quickly talk to that one? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Will, for your question. Uh, we absolutely do have the production factory organized. So many times in between phase two and phase three, companies do not take that opportunity to scale up. They continue to make their clinical supply uh, for clinical trials and, and not think about commercialization. Uh, very positively for us, we've already scaled up to commercial batch size and did that for our phase threes. So right now the commercial product that we are actually going to launch with is, is already made and on stability. So we have that uh, post, post our approval. We'll have a final label uh, carton and packaging that we will ultimately take that product and uh, package it appropriately and send it out to, to our wholesalers and, and ultimately the pharmacies. The factory that we're using for that is one that both Vince, myself, Patty, and Matt have used in the past. Uh, probably for about 20 of the products uh, that, that, that we've launched. They're in North America, and they, they focus very specifically on topical dermatology production. All right. Thanks, Howie. Um, maybe a question for Gautam, and this comes from Michael and, and Anonymous, um, which is uh, you made reference in the presentation, Gautam, to um, – uh, if it's priced at a reasonable price point, then you'd get appropriate payer coverage. Um, do you have an idea at this stage as what a reasonable price point might be, uh, either by reference to other products or or to the market research you've done? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. But I think it's an, it's an important question. I think as we think a little bit about the pricing, I think it's important to also lay the context from a U.S. market perspective thinking about what the gross price is versus what the net price is. So as we spoke to payers, we had conversations with them in terms of what type of net price is important to them. And, and kind of that essentially includes rebates that some plans, but not all plans require. And we also kind of had discussions in terms of thinking about the learnings as we look at other launches in the topical dermatology space over the last several years that there have been a, quite a few of, including that products that have launched north of $1,000 per month, but also thinking about what we saw with products like Hubrexa. Ultimately, as we think about the product within hyperhidrosis, and given the fact, like, like uh, how you mentioned, there's a lot of patients who have this, we think it's actually more important to be conservative from a pricing perspective for SB. And our recommendation is to think more along the magnitude of, uh, I'll kind of paint a pretty broad picture for now and Matt and how we can feel free to uh, refine that as kind of in that 200 to $500 type of pricing, but then having really that flexibility to price that down. If some pairs are pushing back and saying that's too much, having the ability to take the net pricing down, we think is important. Uh, but being able to also have the ability to you know, get the value when a pair is willing to not actually be that focused in terms of trying to get rebates. So our recommendation is in that window, really being aggressive in terms of having conversations with payers and rebating as needed to get access, mm -hmm. even paying for access in that first line uh, utilization. Thanks, Kevin. Howie, I don't know if you want to kind of add to that at all. I do. Thanks, Gotham. And Matt, look, Here's, here's how we see the world. We, we, we see right now that there's a wholesale acquisition cost of about $700 a month out there for treatments that are currently used uh, for hyperhidrosis. Now, now, from there, Gotham was speaking to 
Now, how do you get to the appropriate access? Well, roughly 30% of the plans, 30% of the lives aren't necessarily uh, tightly controlled. Arguably, it's, it's closer to 40. Uh, you know, and, for, and, and for those, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate WAC so that we can then discount down further to you know, those plans that require a lower net price. But, but we do believe that uh, competitive wholesale acquisition cost or, or you know, initial price should be at parity to what's out there already, and potentially a premium. We're going to find that out from the payers and then determine uh, you know, where we need to end at from the net. But we're pretty confident at uh, coming in at uh, parity to a slight premium to what's already out there on the market. Right. Thank you. Um, maybe Howie. Do you want to take the next question from Michael as well, which is um, the presentation kind of highlighted that most folks will go to a dermatologist as opposed to their, their primary care or general practitioner, as we call them in Australia. Um, is this a good thing uh, for uh, botanics and I guess setting up the sales force structure to get to those patients or is it a challenge? No. That, that's one of the things that makes dermatology such an, such an attractive specialty to sell to. You know, whereas other uh, specialties or, or even GPs require a very large sales force in order to hit that uh, 80 percentile of, of prescriptions and or patients, it's highly focused here in derm. So the fact that 80 percent of those patients with hyperhidrosis go to a dermatologist is very, very much in our favor. Because as Gotham said earlier, about 5,000 dermatologists write the vast majority of prescriptions that are filled in dermatology. So a sales force of 30 to 35 uh, will we'll be able to not only cover that physician population, but also have the appropriate activity to ensure that they have the education and the materials necessary to feel confident, not only to use the, or write the product, but also you know, that their patients know, know how to get it uh, and how to stay compliant over time so that they get the benefit uh, and the efficacy that we've seen in our clinical trials. Right. A um, question from Jeff here. Um, maybe, Gautam, do you want to take this one? Um, this is the, the first time we've kind of focused on the opportunity to get to patients using a digital or an online approach. Um, if you had to, to kind of put your finger in the air, um, what kind of, uh, I guess, increase proportionally of the overall expectation from a forecast would you see coming from that channel versus the traditional dermatologist? I guess the, another way of asking the question is kind of what's the upside from that? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And right? I think to some extent, I'll start off with uh, the relevance of this business model is continuing to increase. And we're seeing a lot more companies rely on this. In terms of some of the analogs that we've seen, the, the share of prescriptions that are coming from the website or originating from websites or even that direct to end user mindset can be anywhere from 10 to 50 percent is what we're seeing from from an analog perspective but i think it really depends upon the commercial strategy of the particular company and the product i think being a smaller manufacturer being a disease state that is very consumer and kind of well-being focused, I do think there is quite a bit of a likelihood that you could be on the higher end of that spectrum, especially given the, the level of under treatment or under prescriptions that we're seeing within this market. So I think a, a targeted approach could result in utilization, kind of what we saw with Fexi as an example in that case study, where that was actually the majority of the focus that, that EvoFem had in terms of being able to target patients and being able to get their revenue. So, so we do think it's a large share and, and could be as high as uh, or even north of 50%. Right, thank you. Um, just a question here from Keith, um, which I might take this one just quickly to get uh, through it, which is why is Botanics targeting a, a stronger formula uh, in the US than used in Japan? Um, I think the short answer to that question is uh, both the 5% and the 15% were tested. Uh, the 5% worked, um, but you know, given that you don't want to do a study and not have it work, uh, the 15% was chosen because the safety profile of both uh, concentrations was basically the same. So uh, they used the higher concentration to get the better efficacy uh, because they knew that in increasing it, they wouldn't see additional safety issues. So that's uh, the answer to that one, Keith. Um, 
conscious of time, he'll probably get through another couple of questions here. There's one um, from Bernie, which which relates to the issue we just talked about from a digital perspective, which is will the, the dermatologists or the insurance companies, the payers, have a problem with you accessing patients via the, the digital means? Um, you know, or does it actually help those groups? Yeah, I can take that, Matt. Um, you know, look, dermatologists have indicated to us that they they would be happy to have assistance uh, diagnosing and, and treating these patients, uh, just so long as more patients were treated. So said another way, they're they're on board with that. Uh, with regard to payers, you know, tel telemedicine is accepted in the United States. So the, these these patients are seeing a physician, or at least that physician is is reading the answers to those. Uh, diagnostic questions, and then ultimately making a, a diagnosis and a decision to prescribe a product. So that in itself um, is, you know, a, a physician practicing medicine. Once that prescription is then transferred to the pharmacy, it's based on the coverage from that patient's insurance plan. We've discussed earlier that you know, th this coverage uh, landscape has already been set by other products that have been used to treat hyperhidrosis. So a bit of a long-winded way to address the whole question, but in, in a nutshell, yes, telemedicine uh, is accepted in the United States. In fact, patients here in this case would pay about $25 to, to see that teledoc versus the roughly $40 they might pay to see a dermatologist. So it's in the patient's favor for those that are already going to a dermatologist. Um, and with regard to the prescription going to the pharmacy, it's covered in the same way it would be as if it went to another pharmacy um, by, by, the, by the health plan. Uh, the difference is these pharmacy I'm... partners are going to be this. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, Harry. One other thing I was going to chime in and on is from a payer perspective, payers actually prefer the patient to do kind of more of the, the digital approach just because it's lower cost for them. Uh, and kind of being a consumer of digital to some extent myself over the last year or two, especially since COVID, it's just much easier and cheaper for the payer to say, do something on the web and then they'll have to reimburse the physician a third or half of what they're reimbursing them if they were trying to do it in person and easier for the doctor as well. So we do see, especially for conditions like this, sure. an increasing trend towards the payer saying that it's actually maybe cheaper for them to be able to, to have this versus an in-person visit. Mm -hmm. Correct. So maybe um, just one last question. We've had this one from uh, from Tarzo and and Christopher and a couple of other folks, which is um, what is what is Botanics' intent in respect of commercialization of the product, i.e., launching it uh, ourselves as opposed to selling out to big pharma. Um, maybe I'll take that one really as the final question before we wrap up, which is you know the company is building towards launching this product itself. Um, it has the team in in how in Vince particularly. We've had experience in launching more than more than 30 dermatology products between them. Uh, they can do this. Um, and there are a number of approaches that have come in from other pharmaceutical companies to, to understand what we're going to do with the product, whether we intend to launch it ourselves, whether we're open to licensing it out, continue to have those conversations. Uh, but even if we ultimately do license it out before launch, all of the work that uh, we're doing with Gautam uh, and all of the work that we're doing for commercial prep still needs to be done. So it's either be done by us or it's going to delay the launch if we don't do it and it gets done by the partner. So we add a lot of value to the product uh, by doing this work. We answer a lot of the questions that they have. Uh, we can demand a better price potentially if we go down that licensing route. But at the end of the day, um, it allows us to, to get that, uh, that full value. So um, I, I might call it there. We've, we're about a minute past time. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. And as we said before, if there are further questions, please send them through. We'll try and answer them. Uh, individually. Uh, let me also thank um, Howie McKibben, uh, Chief Operating Officer, and also Garson uh, Agarol for, for attending this morning and, and giving us the benefit of their experience. Uh, it's a very exciting time for the company, obviously, with the mid-cycle review coming up uh, as a de-risking event for the company. And we look forward to a positive outcome from that, fingers and toes crossed, and, uh, and look forward to continuing to add value to this asset uh, throughout the, the course of the FDA approval process. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll end uh, the webinar there. Um, and thank you very much for your support uh, and for your interest. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.